My name is Karma Sawyer. These are my colleagues, Mark Hartney and Daniel Matuzak. And uh, we are going to be leading a session focused on zero carbon power generation. I recently started as an assistant program director at RPE. I'm not new to the RPE family, though. I actually started about two years ago as an RPE fellow. Um, the fellows are an internal think tank within RPE. If you have a chance to meet some of the current fellows, I strongly recommend it. They're a great group of people. Um, during the time that I was working in the fellows program, I spent a good amount of time focusing on carbon capture. I had the opportunity to work in thermal chemical energy storage and some conversion technologies for natural gas. I did recently transition, though, and now I actually am managing a program area in post-combustion carbon capture, um, which is a whole other skill set separate from working in an internal think tank. But overall, my time at RPE has been really very rewarding, not just because of the high-quality people that we have in-house that I learn a lot from on a daily basis, but also because of the people who are actually in the energy innovation community that are very creative and are working so hard to solve some of the large problems that we face as a nation. And so what we're trying to enable today is to show you guys how we think about the stationary power sector so that you can understand, you know, if you're considering applying to, uh, to solicitations in the future, this should give you kind of a framework to think about your technology in. We're going to be doing this by showing you some of the examples of projects that we've already funded. But we have set up ways uh, for you to be able to give us feedback as well. There are some electronic polls, so if you have your, uh, your phone ready for later in the talk, I would encourage you to do that. But we've also set up ways to do question and answer. Now, because of the uh, size of the room and the somewhat uh, limited staffing that we have, I encourage you to submit questions by text or by Twitter, and I have instructions on how to do that later in the talk. But before we get started, we're going to do a low-tech poll because I just want to get a sense of who is in the room. So I'm just going to ask you to answer this question by show of hands to give me a sense of what area of the stationary power generation sector you consider yourself most familiar with. Renewables? Who here is? Okay, we've got a lot of people with renewables. How about fossil or CCS? Okay, it's about 50-50, actually. Nuclear? Something that I forgot? All right, great, great. So this actually looks like a good mix, which is kind of what we were aiming for when we crafted the presentation. This feedback is going to help us when we receive your questions by Q&A to kind of figure out where, uh, where the audience is lying. So let's just dive right into a graph that a number of you are probably familiar with. This is the 2010 Sankey diagram that was put out by Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it's probably a little bit overwhelming. I affectionately refer to this as the spaghetti chart. Um, and again, if you haven't seen it before, it's really not as complicated as it looks. On the left-hand side of the screen are primary energy sources. And as you move towards the right, they turn into some sort of generation process and ultimately end use. Now, we are focusing right here on the center on the generation of electricity. And what you see when you zoom in on that part is the majority of our electricity in the U.S. comes from coal, natural gas, and nuclear. Now, this is just a snapshot from the 2010 generation mix. You could look at this over time and also focus specifically on what the projections will be in the future. So what I have here is generation projections on the y-axis in billions of kilowatt hours for various different primary energy sources. And the last bar that you see is for the year 2035. And what you see when you look at this is that we have a lot of coal, actually about the same amount that we have today, saying that the existing plants we have right now will still be in our energy system in 2035. There are increases in natural gas and in renewables, but specifically for the case of renewables, even though we are looking at a very substantial rise, about a doubling from what we have today, it still makes up a fairly small portion of our total generation mix. Now, we can also look at this from a worldwide perspective. And this is essentially the same plot that I just showed you, but the two lines are the non-OECD countries, their generation mix, and the OECD countries. Now, the non-OECD is in red, and you see that it's rising at a much faster rate than the OECD countries. Again, the last time slot that you see in here is 2035. And if you look at the generation mix at that point, you see a lot of fossil fuel and a good amount of renewables, more than we have today, but still not quite as much as you may want. So what you have implied from these statistics is that the coal plants that we have today, which emit a lot of CO2, are still going to be uh, in our energy sector in 2035, and that we don't have a ton of renewables online. Now, what's um, important to realize about these statistics that I've showed you so far is that they are what would happen without any drastic policy change 
or without any disruptive technology. So this is not necessarily what the future has to look like, but it's what people right now are saying the future could look like. Now, RPE takes all of that information, kind of the way the stationary power sector is projected to look, and we think about what would we like it to look like. Our goal is to have carbon neutral, low cost power. So what we've done is essentially plot those two variables on the y and x axis. We've got CO2 emissions on the y in pounds per kilowatt hour and cents per kilowatt hour on the x axis. And we've plotted various different technologies relative to these two variables. And what you see is that we have some that are, we've got plotted in yellow with a high capacity factor and some plotted in blue with a lower capacity factor, the renewables. Our goal is to reach the bullseye. The bullseye is negligible CO2 emissions with five cent a kilowatt hour electricity. It doesn't really matter to us how we reach that goal. We're very technology agnostic about it. And there are a number of different strategies you can imagine taking to reach it. The first is you decarbonize existing conventional technologies, the fossil space. The second is you ex expand your renewables. Now what's implied in here is that you can get these to move up to be baseload power with some sort of storage. And the third option is that you expand on your renewables. And again, I can't stress enough that we are not saying that any one of these approaches is better than the end. And what's important is that just that you reach your bullseye. Now, one of the very common questions that we get around the stationary power sector is whether or not we're willing to fund nuclear. And we haven't typically in the past. If you look kind of at our broad, first broad open funding announcement, you don't see any funding of nuclear projects. And a good reason for that is really that the size of a typical RPE project is around three to four million dollars over two to three years. And that's pretty low for the capex needed to fund a standard nuclear project. Now that's not to say that we have not funded technologies that could be enabling for nuclear. And the HEATS program area, which is focused on thermal energy storage, is actually a really good example of that. I'm going to be speaking in the thermal energy system session during the next talk. So if you're interested in thermal energy storage, I encourage you to come along and, and see what we have to say about that. But what we essentially found when we were doing a deep dive into the thermal energy storage space was that we had inspiration from solar thermal that affected the nuclear space. If solar thermal wants to achieve a cost target of a dollar a watt, which is the Sunshot Initiative goal from DOE, it has to run at much, much higher efficiencies above, by taking temperatures to above 600 degrees C. There's no thermal storage that works in those temperature ranges. Now, the interesting thing is that if we were to fund thermal storage technologies at those high temperature ranges, it could also affect the nuclear sector. The nuclear sector, their next generation plants also is gonna, are going to run around 600 degrees C. Therefore, if you had thermal storage in that temperature range, you would be able to take nuclear plants from being a baseload technology to one that's peaking. So again, I'm not going to walk in, go into the details of some of these technologies um, right now, but it's a good example of how a creative project in the nuclear space that would be enabling is certainly something that we're interested in within RPE. Now, if you take a step back and look at the broader portfolio of things RPE is funded, you'll see that this is a graph that Eric Toon presented during our first session of the first broad open funding announcements. We funded 37 projects in 2010 across the energy spectrum. And four of them are in the renewable power space, and five of them are in carbon capture. Again, we're essentially just looking for any technology that's going to reach the goal of low-cost carbon neutral power. We also have a series of program areas that are touching on the stationary power generation sector. Just a snapshot of them. First, there's the REACT program, which is looking for rare earth alternatives for wind generators. The solar ADEPT program, power electronics for PV. Again, the HEATS program, which I just spoke about, which is a thermal storage pro program. And the IMPACT portfolio. The IMPACT portfolio is the one that I'm responsible for. IMPACT stands for Innovative Materials and Processes for Advanced Carbon Capture Technologies. We funded 17 projects through the IMPACT portfolio. It's focused on post-combustion carbon capture from coal-fired power plants. What I'm going to do is select a few of the projects from the IMPACT portfolio to use as examples for you as to what an RPE project could look like. And this is a slide, again, that we just saw, but I wanted to reiterate that it's extremely important for you to understand what an RPE project looks like. Again, as Eric Toon said, the most important attribute is its, is its impact, a high impact on the RPE mission area. The first question that RPE asks about a technology is not whether or not it will work, but if it works, will it matter? 
The second is that it's transformational and can leap beyond today's technologies. The third is that it bridges basic science and applied technologies. And the fourth is that you have a best-in-class team. Very often this involves a cross-disciplinary skill set and bringing groups of people who do not traditionally work into the energy sector to, to address some of these problems. An outstanding example of an RPE project is one that we funded at ATK. Now this is our team from ATK standing in front of a supersonic duct. These are a team of aerospace engineers that are using wind tunnel technology to separate CO2 from coal-fired power plants. So this is their supersonic duct, and if you look at a diagram for the process that they've proposed, they would take flue gas from a coal-fired power plant and pass it through a converging and a diverging nozzle. It expands as it goes through that nozzle, rapidly drops the temperature, and the CO2 precipitates out so that it could be collected by a cyclone. Now, this is a drastically different approach to carbon capture than what you have for the state of the art. There would be no chemical waste, very few moving parts, and it easily scales up to the size of a coal-fired power plant. Now, if you look at the cost of electricity projections for the ATK process, right now, and it is preliminary, they're talking about being able to achieve 30 to 40 percent COE increase. If you compare that to point number one on this graph, which is the state of the art immune system, they're at about 80 percent. So in addition to us having these really compelling techno-economic analysis, which admittedly is preliminary, we were essentially, when, they guys, when these guys applied to the impact program, we were in a position of saying, I don't think this cannot work. But we gave them a chance to show it, us that it can. And they've been making some really interesting results. I encourage you to go down and check out their booth at the showcase. Another great example is a project that we funded at RTI down in North Carolina. RTI is taking a little more of a chemical engineering approach to the problem. If you look at state-of-the-art carbon capture technologies, the CO2 is absorbed by a solution of 30% MEA in water. That solution, after it's rich in CO2, is heated in a regenerator. That requires quality, high-quality steam to be diverted from the coal-fired power plant so that it can heat the regenerator up to 120 degrees C. Now, this does, is needed to break the bonds between CO2 and the MEA, but it also, we also spend a lot of that energy to actually heat the water rather than the molecules that have actually bound CO2. As a result, the regenerator is the primary um, offender on terms of the high parasitic load for this process. So RTI took an approach of, of attacking those two problems. They have non-aqueous solvents so that they can run a carbon capture process. The water will separate out just like oil and water and they can pour, decant that water off at some point in a process. They also regenerate these solvents at low temperatures so that they can use the waste heat from the power plant rather than high quality steam. They came to RPE with some innovative chemistry. They're right now they're testing it at the bench scale and they're working with their project partner BASF. By the end of their RPE project they will have tested this in a large bench type scale so that they can see whether they can achieve the potential impact of a 40% energy savings over the conventional process. The third project I want to highlight is one from the University of Colorado at Boulder and Los Alamos National Lab. These folks are pushing the bounds of membrane technologies. What they have are gelled room temperature ionic liquids or ionic liquid composites that they spray into an extremely thin layer onto a porous support. So they're creating a mechanically robust CO2 selective membrane with a permeance of 10,000 GPU. This is taking membrane technology to the state of the art so that it can be deployed in a coal-fired power plant. So instead of having, again, a chemical process with a lot of waste, this is a more passive drop-in approach to doing the, the separation. Now, I've only selected three of the project areas from the impact portfolio. There are 17 in total. They're very interesting, and I would encourage you all to go down to the showcase and talk to the scientists and engineers that are actually working on them. Not only do they have great, uh, great technology to talk, to, uh, talk about, it'll give you a sense of the type of people we've funded in the, fa in the past, and you will certainly learn something from them. I talk to them on a very regular basis, and I always do. Um, but as I said, this is just our fossil approach to looking at the low-carbon car power sector of uh, our generation mix. There are also, there's also the opportunity to look at the renewable space. For that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mark. Great, thank you, Karma. 
So I want to talk about a couple of the other projects that we funded in the first round of solicitations, the Open FOA, and, and focus on those, those few that were in the renewable area. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is 1366, and this was a, actually a, a company that we highlighted last year at the showcase because of the remarkable progress that they've made. I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, solar was one of the areas where we received a tremendous number of concept papers in, the, in that open solicitation. But we thought that many of those were, I think, what, uh, what Arun described in his presentation, is following along that path of, of you know, consistent progress and going to make a, a, a impact, but not necessarily a transformative impact. And we took a look at this, and, and this was one of the proposals that really stood out to us as something that had a chance to put us on a new learning curve. And it's not looking at a new type of film for collecting solar. It's looking at the substrate. And it, it, what it recognizes also is that you know, a lot of development in the solar industry is really focused on what's the best film, what's the highest efficiency I can get. But this comes back and looks at how do I drive the cost down for solar? How do we get this more widely deployed in order to really make a, a stronger impact? If you looked at that, that Sankey diagram from Lawrence Livermore, you'll see that solar is, is really sort of sub-pixel resolution in its contribution to energy generation. And a big part of that is cost, right? So if we can bring the cost down for silicon uh, and bring the cost down for solar, in general, we'll be able to make a substantial impact on this. So what we show here is the, the, on the top part of the slide is the conventional process for making silicon wafers. You take pure silicon, you melt it, you cast an ingot, you cut it into bricks of wafer scale, and then you grind and polish those and then slice them into wafers that can then be processed, regardless of what kind of technology you're putting on, the, on there. But you know, typically for, for uh, uh, crystalline or, or polycrystalline solar, that's the approach to it. And you can see at that little pile at the bottom that typically 45% of the silicon is wasted. In the bottom picture shows what 1366 is doing, and they call this a direct wafer process. It's basically a single machine which can take that, that, uh, that silicon and pull it out into a polycrystalline wafer with essentially zero wasted silicon. There's no loss on that. So you can see it's a very, uh, very novel and very innovative approach, and it addresses a real shortcoming in, in, in the way that, uh, that wafers are made through the conventional process. So this was the, uh, the graph that they, they included in their original proposal. So the data is maybe a little bit old here, but it shows what a compelling advantage that they offered here. So something that was really transformational and a real breakthrough here. Uh, and you can see that you know, based on, on the cost of silicon that's in there, you're looking at almost an 80% uh, cost reduction. Now, today, wafers have probably dropped from 73 cents to maybe below 50 cents, and uh, the price of silicon has come down a little bit, but, but you can see that that will reduce not only the 15 cents that they've got uh, to a smaller level, but they still maintain a significant advantage. So I think here's an important lesson also to think about as you're putting your proposal together. Every technology that's there as an incumbent in the marketplace is making progress. The costs that you see today are not the costs that are going to be the same you're competing against three years from now when your technology is ready. So you have to kind of understand the trajectory that these technologies are on. What's that learning curve look like for the existing technology? How fast are they making progress? And do you have something that is compelling now but maybe not going to be compelling three years from now as this technology continues to invest and, 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 and evolve? So make sure that you've got an opportunity that's not only you know, uh, uh, a compelling opportunity today but, but future-proof against the, the, the expected rate of progress and what's going to go forward there. And this is an example which clearly has been that case, and so very exciting um, uh, technology that continues to go forward. At the stage this project was funded, they had done some very preliminary demonstrations at a, at a small scale in, a, in basically a hot, pay, hot plate on a lab. You know, and today, through the course of the RPE project, they've been able to grow that up to conventional wafer sizes, in, increase the rate of production that they're able to do from that. And, and as Karma said, I encourage you to, to go downstairs, spend some time talking to 1366, learn a little bit more about their technology, learn about their experience with RPE, not just through the proposal, but through the management of the project. And, and, and I think it's good to hear, not, not only from our perspective, but from, from, from the, the people who are, would be in the same shoes that uh, the potential proposers would be as well. So as I said, this was one of the, the, uh, the, the solar projects, and in fact, the only solar project that we had done in the open FOA. We've since gone on to do some of the power electronics through the ADEPT program, solar ADEPT program, and uh, there will be opportunities and, and performers here for that as well. Uh, the second project I'd like to talk about is, again, one we also highlighted a little bit last year, which is Makani Power, and this is in the wind area. We funded three projects in wind technology, and each of these was, was a, I'd say, a significant departure from the conventional horizontal axis wind turbines that you see being deployed today and, and growing to larger and larger scales. The concept here is in, shown, shown in the, uh, the top right corner is that this is actually an airborne wind turbine. It's on a wing, and there are turbines on this wing, but this wing flies through the sky in a circle 
comparable to the way you might think the swept area of a blade from a conventional wind turbine does. Uh, there are onboard generators on there, and the power is conducted back down to the ground through a tether. And the challenge in this uh, technology was not only to show that the flight technology was robust, but that it could be fully automated and run as an autonomous system. And that's what the first part of this, uh, this program has been through the RPE award. We see a lot of advantages to this. And so one of the things that really drew us to this was, again, the opportunity for a very disruptive, game-changing, price-competitive advantage relative to conventional technology that's out there. And wind turbine technology for the horizontal axis wind turbines is, is a fairly mature technology, and there's benefits to going to larger scales and larger turbines, but there's limits to that. And this gave us an opportunity to be very disruptive relative to that. So I don't know how well you can see this, but on the left-hand side, there's a conventional power generation curve where we've got the power and the wind speed plotted on the uh, on the Y and X axis, respectively. And you can see as the wind increases, the power goes up until it reaches the rated wind speed. The curve on the right is what you see for a conventional horizontal axis wind turbine. And so it, it uh, kicks into full rated power at about 12 meters per second, about 20 mile an hour winds. Uh, it starts to produce energy and ramps up slowly until it reaches that rated power. Uh, and it, it'll run at that point. And then high winds, you actually have to, have to throttle it back a little bit uh, to keep it there. The advantage for the Makani power is that it actually kicks into full rated power at a much faster speed and, and reaches that full rated power at about half the wind speed. So what that means in, at the end of the day is the capacity factor for this is nearly twice as high. If you have a one megawatt turbine, it's typically got a 30% capacity factor for a horizontal axis wind turbine. So you're making 300 uh, kilowatts out of a one megawatt rated turbine. In this case, you're making nearly twice as much energy. And you get that from two different factors. The first is because you're up in the air, you're actually flying a little higher than what the base of a, or, or the, uh, the hub height is for a conventional turbine. So wind gets better as you go aloft. Um, so there's, there's an advantage to that. The second piece is that the wind across the turbines being on the wing actually sees the apparent wind speed of the wing as it flies around rather than the ground speed of the wind as well. So those two things combined together give you a much higher capacity factor for this. You'll actually be able to see this, this wing. They're bringing it here to the showcase, and I encourage you to, to spend a little time and, and, uh, and talk with the team there and, and understand that technology a little bit more. In addition to the performance advantage, though, what's really nice is that there's a, there's a, there's a cost advantage, not only in the capital cost, but in the cost of production. And when we focused on this two years ago and, and, and decided this was an interesting technology, we were thinking primarily of onshore applications. And in the onshore application, you cut the capacity or the capital investment to uh, not quite half, but close to half of the value there. And the big difference here is you need much less mass to, to be able to, to generate the wind on a per kilowatt basis here. Um, so you can see that there's, there's slightly different technology that's required there, but you go from about $1.40 a watt for installed capital cost down to about $0.80 cents a watt for the, for the Makani uh, airborne wind turbine. Nowadays, a lot of the wind development and a lot of the, the opportunity is really focusing on the offshore uh, wind deployment. Better winds there, uh, there's siding advantages to that, and, and it, but it's a challenging environment. So it requires, if you take that conventional horizontal axis wind uh, turbine technology to, to you know, sink enormous foundations and large poles and a lot of stresses that you have to deal with uh, for this offshore deployment. So it's been, a, it's been a real challenge, and we're just now starting to see you know, offshore wind farms being built. With the kind of technology that Makani is looking at, however, because it's flown on a tether, it, 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 it has a different coupling mechanism to what the base station is. You can deploy this with a relatively low cost and, and modest weight uh, a ballasted uh, a platform that sits out in the ocean. And so there's, again, nearly a 50% reduction in the capital cost that you could get from that. So some really compelling advantages and things that we believe, much like 1366, will have some real staying power relative to the kind of cost projection curve we're going to see for the incumbent technology. It's, it, it's an innovative technology, and it's one that, that you know, we think is kind of the quintessential RPE uh, type of project. A little bit of early demonstration work that they had done. Uh, it, it we're able to go, go up and do some, some demonstration on soft wings, but recognized that rigid wings were an important area to go forward with. And you know, what we, when they came to us, they said you know, they laid out a plan for demonstrating a number of different pieces. Key to one of those, as I said, was the control technology. And what you can see here is a composite photograph of the wing and its power generation flight. And then inset into that is actually the, the position chart during one of their flights. And you can see the incredible control that's enabled through this system to enable it to, to fly very repeated path loops, get consistent power generation, and demonstrate the control authority that they have over the flight of this, uh, of this wing in space. So it's been, a, I'd say, a very exciting project thus far. Uh, we look forward to continuing the work with Makani. And again, I'd encourage you to, to uh, go and, and take a look at what they're doing uh, down in the showcase. And I think, as I said, the wing will actually be here.
So I wanted to give you, again, a, a, a flavor of a couple of different projects, some of the things that we looked for and found exciting about them. I think a consistent theme between these and the projects that Karma talked about is having a good, solid understanding not only of the technology that you're looking at, but at the techno-economic evaluations and, and what's the difference going to make. You know, in order for something to actually be a disruptive force, to actually be deployed, there has to be a performance advantage and a, and a cost advantage for that uh, that is going to, to garner the marketplace attention to come in and, and actually deploy this technology. Without that, it's interesting technology, but it's, it's got to have a pathway to that. So what we look for in proposals is people who have a very rich understanding of that and, and, and understand the subtleties and the nuances related to that, as well as what that projections are going to look like for the incumbent technology. So I hope that's given you a little bit of a flavor for some of the projects that we're, we're, uh, we're funding and what we liked about them. I think at this point, we're going to, we're going to move into a little bit more of the, uh, the interactive polling that we've got. So go ahead and pull out your phones, and I'm going to uh, turn this to, to Karma, who is going to uh, walk us through how we're going to exercise the, uh, the polls. All right. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> yes. uh, so this is a little bit of an exper experiment on our part. So everybody does have their uh, cell phones out, I'm assuming. And what we've done here is we're just going to poll you to get a sense of what you guys think are the important things that could happen in the stationary power sector. We really are sincere. You know, when we have these RFIs that are coming out, we want to, to hear your feedback because the most important part of us having these broad solicitations is for us to understand what the energy innovation community looks like. So this is just one tool that we're going to you know, give a try with at the summit. Um, it will be most fun if everyone participates, so I really do encourage you to do it. It would be sad if I did this and I only saw five people voted. So you're going to have the opportunity to, you know, you're going to select the choice that you want. Say your favorite color is green and you will be able to text your code into a number. Or if you are one who tweets, I'm not, so you'll have to forgive me if I use the terms incorrectly. You can also tweet this in by using this at poll and then whatever code that you want. So our first poll is focused on the renewable generation sector. Which of these do you think is the most critical challenge, the biggest challenge to getting more renewables on the grid? Now, if you vote, it will automatically start populating within the next 30 seconds or so. So let's give it a shot. Mark and Dan, if you guys, oh, we aren't allowed to have our phones, so you don't get to vote. But, so away. you guys need to speak on behalf of the energy innovation community and give it a shot. We'll see if we uh, start getting some feedback. One person voted. All right, somebody else, we got something out there? Looks like a landslide. All right, it's a landslide. Let me guess, somebody who works in the storage space? All right, we're getting something. Everybody vote. I'm very curious. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised. All right, somebody's voting for policy. I, I thought we'd get a little more of a hit there. Anybody else? Wow, we got some cost of, cost of the generation technology. Mark, you must have been convincing. I In your so. discussion of 1366 and, uh, great, great here. I got to say, this is not the response that I expected. I really started, thought that we'd see a lot more for, oh, see, storage. I thought storage was going to be the, the takeaway winner here. <laughs> no, actually, we can't. We tried to be able to figure that out. Uh, we actually broke a poll on Friday in the office trying to do that. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, this is interesting. We're going to go to the, the next one, which is a little bit higher level. So this kind of goes back to our initial hand, show of hand poll. Which of the following do you think will be the largest source of low cost and low carbon electricity in 2050? So, so do your own generation mix projection. Do you think that, uh, that we're going to be able to achieve this? This is, I guess, first is assuming that we will be able to achieve any of these. But uh, imagine what you think will be a disruptive technology and what will end up really hitting the stationary power sector hard. I guess I wasn't as convincing with my fossil fuel and CCS talk as I thought. Karma, do you have some magic thing? Every time you bring up one that's I know, lagging, one it, of it them, suddenly I guess jumps, right? I'm so. really actually controlling this <laughs> you have myself. A super vote. <laughs> I think we need to cheer for one of those. Go CCS. I guess I'm surprised that, that I saw three or four hands with nuclear, but a lot of people put that up there as the That is really interesting solution. to see yeah. the nuclear uh, space really pulling forward. All right, guys, I think I'm going to call our little experiment a success. I'm actually, I am really surprised to see the, the feedback you guys are giving. It's, it's different than I, I expected it to be. So 
Um, you guys, you know, you might have some different insight into this space than we do. And this is, this is really a, a, good, uh, a good space for us to be able to, again, take a snapshot of what you think. Because you guys are the ones out there actually, you know, doing the work in the lab. And I think we can always learn from that. So at this point, we're going to switch gears and do kind of a little more of a traditional Q&A. Um, now, as Eric mentioned during our, um, our plenary session, you know, we just want to get up front that, you know, there is an RFI out right now for a broad open solicitation for RPE. And we do want to get a lot of feedback for you guys. There's a reason we did this as an RFI rather than just having a live open POA on the street. And that is because we wanted to be able to talk to the community. So as Eric said, you're always welcome to come and talk to the RPE staff about your technology. However, in this sec section right now, we're a bit more limited because it is an open space and it's Q&A. And in general, when we say that we want your feedback, we really can't talk about your proposal itself, the nitty-gritty of your technology, whether or not your idea will be high impact or transformational. You know, neither Mark nor I want to sit up here and just give you guys kind of a canned response about a specific technology. So while we absolutely want you to ask questions, kind of keep that in mind, because I think this session will be most useful for everyone if we're not giving those canned responses that our lawyers prepared us with. Um, now, on terms of the technology here, again, because we are in this very big room, we have found, we've found a way that it's, I think will be a little faster for us to be able to get information back and forth from you guys, where you'll be electronically submitting questions. And you can do this by text or by Twitter. Now, if you decide to text, you send your text to the number 22333. And this is going to remain up here this entire time. And then you put the code. 499244 right in front of your question. You text that in or you can um, tweet it in by using at poll the same code and your question. Now what's going to happen is, you know, think about your question and start t typing them up and it's going to go to Daniel here. Daniel will be asking these questions to Mark and I. Now, if you are uncomfortable voting this way for whatever reason, we do have people up front. Um, Ryan, you want to hold your hand up there so people see you? We've got note cards and pens. If you would rather submit this way, raise your hand. Ryan will run around and uh, get his exercise for the day by collecting your, uh, your questions and, and end up passing them up here again to Daniel, and he'll ask them. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to collect your thoughts, and once Daniel starts to get uh, responses in, we'll take your questions. We're going to pass out 500 note cards, but only one pen. <laughs> <laughs> As you guys consider questions, maybe I could start off. Absolutely. Uh, why did ARPA-E choose to fund post-combustion post carbon capture technologies for impact? Mark, this was your brainchild. I'll let you take this one. Sure. I, I think um, what was really a, a compelling drive there was we looked at, at some of these projections going forward and the recognition that while there may not be a lot of new generation capability being built, there was a significant, you know, as, as, as Karma showed, 50 percent of the electricity generator today was coming from coal-fired power plants, and most of those were anticipated to stay in production for 20 to 30 years. So we really looked at... Um, you know, particularly given given sort of the investment environment that we were in at the time, that, that solving the problem with the existing deployed base had a high leverage factor to it, and was also the kind of technology that could be uh, developed and deployed not only in the U.S. but on a, on a worldwide basis. So we we felt that that was probably the biggest opportunity, and and an opportunity that something needed to be done to be addressed with. Uh, so so a real focus on post combustion capture. You know, we did in the in the first round, as Karma showed, had five CCS projects, and one of those was actually a chemical looping project, so it's more akin to sort of an oxy combustion yeah. kind of approach. So that was that was an innovative uh, power generation technology uh, uh, utilizing uh, uh, gasifiers. So so we've, we've, we have a little bit of diversification in the portfolio. We also funded in the impact program, um, you know, a couple of projects that are looking not just at capturing and sequestering the carbon, but at actually turning that into uh, you know mineral substances, which would be be a different form of sequestration. So we have some diversity in there, but we really felt that, that the idea of addressing you know, the existing problem that was going to be persistent was, was a high leverage uh, use of, of funds. And we also thought there was a lot of innovation in there. I think Karma showed some, a couple of examples there. We've highlighted a few more. But getting a good understanding of what that core technology was all about, what the amine process is, what were the leverage points that could come in and address that in unique ways, I think led to a, a really exciting set of proposals. 
The one thing that I would add to that is that when you, you start looking at the impact of you know, having to capture CO2 from a coal-fired power plant, people, a lot of times they talk about the cost of electricity. But when you actually think about it, it's not just that. You actually would end up needing to build 30% more generation when you tack on that. So at that point, we're talking about not having enough energy for our nation's needs if we use the state-of-the-art technology, if you end up being to the point that you have to capture the CO2 from a coal-fired power plant. And that's, at that point, you're talking about the security of our nation in terms of being able to do things like, you know, keep our hospitals running and, and refrigerate food. So it's really, um, it's really very critical, not just for our environmental security, but also for us to be able to have consistent, cheap energy. Thank you. Um, is RPE considering running a phase two of the impact program? You know, that's a very good question. Um, and, you know, RPE hasn't really been around long enough to really test out this mode. Um, Eric Toon did mention that there is a RFI for a phase two of electrofuels that's on the street right now. So it's certainly the type of mechanism that we're talking about internally, and it's a way that we could, um, we could go. I think what ultimately is going to, it's going to depend on the strategy that RPE views going forward in the coal-fired power plant space. It's certainly something that we're considering, but I don't think there's been a decision made yet whether there will be a specific opportunity, funding opportunity for people to apply to. It's still being discussed internally. So I think if I can add on to that, you know, one of the things we benefit from in, in the impact space is that, you know, this isn't a, a, a completely, you know, greenfield new idea that started up, and uh, unlike electrofuels. And so uh, those people who have been part of the impact program know that every year when we hold our annual meeting, we hold it jointly with the NETL program that looks at carbon capture. And, and they, in a lot of sense, I think, sort of pick up where we leave off in terms of the technology maturation. They've got projects that can take the, that technology and scale it to a larger size and actually test it with a, a you know, real-life power plant uh, exhaust stream at places like the National Carbon Capture Center. So as we see you know, successful technologies coming in out of the impact project, a big part of the opportunity, not the only one, but a big part of the opportunity may be to, to go and do a follow-on larger-scale demonstration project with our partners at NETL. Given the resources that they've got, the investment they've already made in some of those facilities like that, uh, but that, that's also a, a, you know, another opportunity for people to bring innovative technologies and, and continue them down that, that development stage. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, I'm getting a plethora of questions from the audience. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to push carbon capture just a little longer before I transition to an, another subject because there were a lot of questions on CO2. Um, here's one. How much attention are you giving to CO2 utilization versus CO2 sequestration? This is, this is a great question, and one of the things that I would encourage the, you as a community, but specifically the person who asked this question, to do is to go to the government networking session. Because at the government ne networking session, there is a booth from the carbon capture and utilization and storage technology team. So this is actually a new push within the Department of Energy to not only focus on sequestering CO2, but also in using it. So within the Department of Energy, there's certainly an awareness of this opportunity. Um, within RPE, you'll note, for example, the, the session that will be on this stage immediately following this one is on uh, using biology and energy to create liquid fuels. If you look at the electrofuels program, which will be discussed then, there is a need for a stream of CO2 to be able to create liquid fuels. That's certainly something that RPE is aware of. Um, and there are some synergies, obviously, between the programs that I discussed in the carbon capture space and anything that uses CO2 as a feedstock. I'll actually be talking about this in the thermal energy storage system as well. So while we haven't actually directly linked the impact portfolio with these utilization programs, these programs do exist within RPE, and it's certainly something that we're aware of in the space. Is Mr. Hartney on Richard Branson's United Nations Carbon War Room? No, I am not. <laughs> okay. Thank you for clarifying. Um, more seriously, this is, this is a question that's um, a little more general, the following question. Um, it's addressed for the area of CCS, but I think you can speak to, to many technologies when I ask this. Um, how does RPE's CCS, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. This is coming in very quickly. 
does CCS have enough money to stand behind itself? Can it solve its own problems with the funds that are there from industry? So if I understand that question specifically, it's whether it's a question generally about the industrial interest in the CCS space. And I certainly am, I mean, I'm not a member of industry, so it's, um, you know, I'm not speaking from specific experience, but I can say from conversations that I've had that people in the power generation space realize that ultimately this will be something they will need to address. They know the number of coal-fired power plants we have, and they know the amount of CO2 that they emit. Ultimately, this will be something that's important to them. However, the policy space we're in right now does not mean it has to be dealt with from their perspective on the short term. I actually view um, carbon capture, in my personal opinion, as being something that's really ideally suited for government funds because it addresses an externality for, for our energy system that industry is not, does not have any incentive to deal with on their own. So I think ultimately, you know, the policy is going to determine the future of the CCS and exactly the path that it takes. Right now, I don't expect there to be a huge industrial involvement just because of the, the, um, the policy space, but those certainly are not the only options for pushing CCS forward. As Mark mentioned, we have colleagues at, um, in Fossil Energy and at the National Energy Technology Lab that focus entirely on um, post-combustion capture through an existing plants program. They have a lot of money and they have a lot of resources to be able to push them forward. And that's an important use of the Department of Energy dollars. Yeah, I, think, I guess let me come back to the point Karma emphasized a, a little earlier. So, I mean, you could imagine today that we have a technology. We have an amine technology which has been tested on, on cleaning up natural gas. And it works for CO2 capture. And we could deploy that and it would cost you know, 80 to 100 dollars a ton, maybe a little more for the first plants. But as Karma said, you know, the cost of energy to run those plants is actually about 30 percent of the energy we produce. So capturing all the CO2 out of that technology, all the CO2 from the plants that we produce today, would essentially mean we turn off 30 percent of those plants in terms of providing electricity out to the grid. And that's an awfully large disruption uh, that's out there. So what we really look for, and, and you know, the way I've often described the impact program, is being able to get down the cost of energy, being able to get down the parasitic load on the plant to a point where deployment becomes more feasible. And the way you do that in the early stages is with a lot of laboratory experiments on some very novel technologies, very much like that curve Arun showed with, the, with that learning curve of technologies. And it's great you can get some good, good uh, uh, early insights into technologies, will they work or not work, and screen them out at a fairly early stage. And then we have to move it down that scale of deployment. And, and as you do that, you find some technologies maybe don't continue down that path. Some of those learning curves stop, but stop at a little bit of a later point. And I think we're still really in a fairly early stage. If you look at the demonstration projects that have been done through fossil energy, you know, even the largest of those are probably sub-tenth of the, of the capacity of what they really need to be operating at, at, at scale. And at the point where we're at now, I think you know, one of the things that the Department of Energy has done and the fossil energy has done is a carbon capture simulation initiative that says, how much can we learn, how can we learn effectively, cost-effectively, how to maybe skip a couple of these steps and scale that faster when we get to the solutions and the policies that are in place to do that. So I think there's a lot of innovative thinking about how do we address that and, and looking for, again, alternative uses for CO2 in today's environment where, where the policy may not be you know, quite ready and the technology may not be quite ready yet for that wider scale deployment. So looking for the cost effective utilization of the funds that we do have against that and continuing to make progress so that we're in a position to be able to deploy the best technology and deploy it quickly uh, when, when everything falls into place. A couple of questions uh, that are coming in rather quickly. Um, what will what will be the role of China given their massive use of coal? Is there a collaboration potential? Also, do you see a role for global partners, or is this U.S. domain only? Could you speak to any of those? I, I think this is a really good question, and you know, this was a point that I was trying to make earlier in my presentation that it's really not a U.S. problem. There's a lot of coal generation that's currently done and will continue to be done in other parts of the world. I, I personally don't know if we're asking about a collaboration between RPE and China. I, not that I know of. There's nothing that's at, in place right now. But when we think about ways that we could get the technologies from the impact program into the market, certainly I would encourage a worldwide view of the space to see if there are opportunities, not just within the U.S., but perhaps at you know, processing facilities or industrial spaces um, abroad. That certainly is something I would encourage anyone working in the carbon capture space 
to be aware of. Sure, and I think outside of RPE, again, the department has, has a, a U.S.-China Clean Coal Partnership Program. Uh, there are activities that are going on uh, to, to try and foster some of those technology interactions and exchanges. And, and frankly, some of the opportunities at the, at the rate of new plants being built in China relative to the U.S., it's likely that some of these technologies could be deployed there first. But we would like to see that be successful technologies that develop out of some of these kinds of programs and, and get an opportunity to pilot. I, I know a couple of the performers have been approached by people saying, you know, we'd be willing to, to pilot those technologies. And, you know, we view this as a, as a global challenge. And so it's something that, you know, can't just be deployed in the U.S. in order to be effective. And the thing that I would add on to this is that if we think about actually having clean, sustainable energy long term, it probably will really be only be important if we can get a global, everyone on the same page and actually to be able to curb their emissions at a similar rate. So I think that global community building type um, technology innovation has a lot of value specifically in this space because the CO2 that's in the atmosphere is certainly not localized over the place that it's submitted. Thank you. Thank you. We have a lot of questions on CCS and CO2, but we also have a lot of people in the audience that are interested in renewables, and I'm going to try to distribute the questions from now on. But if I don't get to your question, um, we will do our very best to get answers to you one way or another. We're in a very high-tech age. We might even publish these. Um, we'll have to talk a little further about that. Uh, here's a really interesting question. We, we, we're seeing a surge in natural gas. We're talking about natural gas vehicles. Um, how do you see natural gas affecting the value proposition for renewables, CCS? How do you see that playing a role? Um, I mean, I, I would say that natural gas is kind of the elephant in this session. Um, we are all aware, you know, later in this, um, in the summit, we have a panel on making the most of the natural gas boom. We've had a number of workshops over the course of the last year looking at natural gas. And right now, natural gas, a significant portion of natural gas is being used in the stationary power sector. And in the event that there is any policy change that would encourage the limitation of CO2 emissions from the stationary power sector, uh, people would try to shift their generation mix to use natural gas first rather than going to coal. So I, I admit that it will, you know, there, this is a competition. Like I said, uh, when we, um, when I presented kind of the way RPE thinks about the stationary power sector, you know, switching, doing some sort of fuel switching is certainly an option when you're kind of on the path to achieving low carbon, low cost stationary power. Natural gas is, can certainly be a part of that competition. I fully expect that it will be. It's a very large natural resource and, uh, there is no reason to expect that it would not play a significant role in what our generation mix will look like in the future. Yeah, and I think, you know, when we, when we started the program and we'd gone around and talked to a number of utilities, we asked a lot of people about, about the opportunities to switch fuel mix to, to, to natural gas. And, that, you know, many of the people we talked to, the history was that they had kind of walked down that path before and been, been burned. The price instability in natural gas is a, it has left a lot of scars in the industry, I think. And, and I think now, what we, in, the, in the last two years, I think people have become more confident in the, in the resource and, and, the, and the availability here, uh, more confident in price stability. So I think we're starting to see, um, that, you know, and even I think even the EIA data showed that there's been a, a, a dip in, in, in coal utilization in the last few years and an increase in natural gas. So I think, I think that's the start of a trend that is, is likely to, to actually make a fairly significant reduction in CO2 and give us, you know, a little more, a little more headroom and a little more time to be able to uh, develop some of the more renewable technologies. I would say that one interesting thing about the natural gas space that I've, uh, I've kind of realized while working at RBE is that you know, there's a lot of interest in figuring out ways that we can use this natural resource of fossil fuels in our transportation sector. Um, we, we've had a lot of discussions and workshops internally specifically around the transportation sector, which is a huge portion of our energy sector. And in, in the event that, our, that natural gas is able to become a significant transportation fuel, I wonder how that would impact the stationary power sector. I certainly don't have an answer to it, but it's something that you know, we, uh, we think about, about a lot internally. I've had a number of debates with uh, some of the RBE fellows who have spent some time thinking about the natural gas space. And, and that, I think, it still remains to be seen because it, it's, a big, it's a big variable. I think that's true about the natural gas space in general. It remains to be seen exactly how it will play out. Speaking of natural gas, this has been on my mind for a while, but thankfully somebody posed it. Uh, will RPE look at technologies that can clean natural gas fracking water? 
Th that's a very good question. And I would, um, I, so I, I would encourage this person, assuming that they have some specific technology in mind, um, I think that the, uh, the open RFI that we have on the street could be a really good opportunity for, for a technology like this. I would, um, I would encourage you to look at it. For, if your technology is appropriate, it would, it would be a great thing for us to be able to entertain. Uh, it's certainly something that we, again, discuss a lot internally. It's something that we have a lot of interest in. Um, you know, some of the things that we are interested in, we don't have uh, active programs on. Some of that is because we haven't quite found the, uh, the art bite or what the appropriate RPE play is in that space. Um, some of it is simply that we're bandwidth limited. We can only have so many you know, open program areas at a time. But I, uh, I see no reason, you know, we're fairly technology agnostic, that we couldn't address areas um, around the environmental concerns with natural gas production. I guess I would say that you know go back to the to the four criteria that we look at and and you know if we if we can see an idea that comes in and and really is a disruptive game changer in there has has a lot of potential to to uh, change the way that that people are 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 using conventional treatment to technology to do this uh, today or or uh, you know give a clear path to market those are the kind of things that we look for and and in in an open solicitation um, as you saw from the the kinds of projects we selected in the first round we covered a very diverse portfolio and we and we did in, include one that had uh, a focus on water and, and primarily on des desalination of water. So, water is an area we've been been interested in. We've actually held a workshop in water early in the in the RPE uh, tenure, and it's I think becoming even more apparent to us that that's an important aspect of, of the energy systems going forward. So, some people think fracking water is a big technology hurdle, at least cleaning it up. Um, another question came in as to what you think might be the biggest key technology aspects that, that would enable broad scalability of renewables, so outside of natural gas. Ah, so they're turning the poll question around to Mark and I. <laughs> Smart. Um, I actually, if, if we're talking about, I guess the question for me is a question of time scale. Ultimately, if you, you want a completely sustainable and, and low carbon um, energy economy, I, I would say something like having renewables and uh, so the question is around having more renewables on the grid? Correct. I, I, would, I would probably put a, a lot of emphasis on the storage personally. I think that being able to transition it from a, um, a, to a peaking, from a peaking to a base load power would really be incredibly game changing in terms of how we could use our renewables. It would just change the strategy for how you would view your generation mix potential. So I'll take the counterpoint to that. I mean, I think that's a, that's a key one. But I think you know, if we go back to the poll question, a lot of people also looked at what the what the price was and uh, of that, and bringing them down to to cost parity uh, without subsidy to that. And and I think um, we've made a lot of progress on that in the past few years um, within the department and and within industry. You know, there's tremendous amounts of innovation uh, that have, that have taken place in that. You know, the price of solar has probably come down, you know, two or threefold in the last few years, and and we believe it'll continue to decrease. And you know, I talked. A little bit during the 1366 part of the, of the presentation, but if you look at the at the DOE Sunshot, you know, just trying to get to a dollar a watt installed as the as the baseline price for that, it was it was clear from a recognition there that it's not just you know what's the film and what's the efficiency of the film, but it's things like the substrate, like the like the power electronics in, in the inverter, like the balance of systems and the installation costs. As you get as you get the price where everybody has put a lot of a lot of innovation into making more efficient thin films more cheaply, it no longer becomes sort of the the, the big driving function in there and substrate costs or installation costs can be equally as important. And we're, we're getting that down to the point uh, where I think it's starting to be uh, in the next year or two will we'll, we'll become, you know, essentially grid parity equivalent. Uh, wind is the same kind of thing. Um, if you talk to uh, uh, you know, a lot of people who are looking at sort of the utility scale deployment for these things, you'll find that uh, some of the things that were on the survey that didn't get as much attention are, are equally important. Things like regulation, things like siting, things like transmission uh, for some of these things are, are very, uh, very important challenges that, that you may have the right technology solution to go forward, uh, but, but you know, keep the, the deployment from rolling out as quickly as it can. Once we get all that technology on place, I agree. The grid, grid storage is going to be a really critical part of enabling that to happen. But there's a number of fronts there. Some of them RPE touches on, but some of them we, we really don't in terms of, of the policy uh, aspects of these. Um, along the lines of the prior question, do you think that solar can reach the same scale as wind in the United States? What are the drivers and barriers? 
We might have to wrap up shortly. So, uh, yes, I believe that it, that, it can, that it can. Ultimately, I think um, some of the things I just talked about in terms of, of, of siting and, and, and grid connectors are some of the biggest challenges to that. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of demonstration projects. I, I live in California, and there's a, there's a tremendous amount of solar resource there, and a, and a lot of that is being, being deployed, and a lot of, lot of large-scale utility projects are going in um, and, and are planned. There's, part of that's driven by, by state uh, renewable portfolio standards that I think is, is leading to the deployment. And, and as I said, clearly just in the last few years, uh, from the learning technologies that have come from the scaling up, you know, we're starting from a very small place. I mean, less than 1% than of, the, of the electricity generated comes from solar, less than, than probably a half a percent is. But it's, but it's growing at an incredibly fast pace. And I see that, uh, that I think that will continue to go and, and continue to, to be deployed. And, and the pace is limited as much by uh, some of these other non-technology factors today as it is by, by the growth in the technology and the manufacturing uh, and the industry expertise. Thank you for that. I, um, I'm getting some indication that we might need to transition. Carmen, did you want to say anything in closing? Well, I, I first wanted to thank you all for uh, you know, participating in all of our, our new electronic ways of, of trying to have these communications. Uh, Daniel's indicated that we've gotten a lot of feedback for you, and I assure you that we will be reading these and see what type of feedback and questions you have for us. Again, we, uh, we will be around. For the, the rest of the three days, so please you know, come up and, and engage with us. That is why we he we're here. We want to be able to, to know about the energy innovation community. But I hope that this was a useful experience for, for you. It certainly was for me, and I think I speak for Mark as well, that it's, it's been a pleasure for us to be able to, to share with you some of the work that we do at RPE. We're very proud of our awardees and of uh, you know, what, what we do here, so, so it's always a pleasure. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.